Ezra chapter 4. This is our fifth week of Ezra. If you've missed the other Ezra messages, you can find them online. You can go to YouTube and search Pastor Pat Edgerton, and they will pull up the Revenge Church and find messages maybe that you have missed. Uh, you can also go to our Facebook page. We tend to post the link on there, too. You can find it that way so that you can catch back up. Just a quick reminder, then, Ezra, uh, written by Ezra. Ezra and Nehemiah is actually what we're going to go through, which is two books. But whenever you get into antiquity, they're always together. Uh, these books deal with the Jews coming out of Babylonian captivity. So if you don't remember, just a quick reminder, uh, after Solomon... Uh, King Solomon, then the Jews split, and there's the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. The northern kingdom is conquered by the Assyrians, and then they go into uh, disappear. We don't know the ten tribes, where they ended up, what happened to them in history. The bottom two, uh, Judah and Benjamin, then are the southern kingdom. They run around until the Babylonians come along. Now, the Babylonians come from Babylon, hence Babylonian. Uh, Babylon is a big Assyrian city state that gets so large that it rises up and overthrows the Assyrian government and takes control of Assyria. When it takes control of Assyria, then it marches on uh, Jerusalem because Jerusalem had sided with Egypt in the world conflict. Uh, when it sided with Egypt, that was not a, you picked the wrong horse to back. And so then Babylon shows up and it takes the Jewish people and puts them into exile. It takes the temple apart, tears it down. Uh, it ransacks and wrecks Jerusalem and all of this jazz. And they end up in exile in Babylon 70 years. After 70 years, then Daniel, who was a prophet at the time, he starts to prophesy, hey, we're entering into the time of Jeremiah. Jeremiah was a prophet who said that we'll come out of exile out of Babylon. So then what happens is the Persians conquer Babylon. When they conquer Babylon, then Cyrus the Great tells everybody to go back to your place uh, where you're originally <coughs> from and worship your original gods because the Persians recognized it was easier to uh, subjugate people if you let people live where they're from as opposed to removing them from there and making them slaves and mistreating them. That doesn't really make for a happy populace. So, all that to say that we have dealt with them coming out of Babylon. They come back. Remember, then they rebuilt the altar first so that they could do sacrifice. And then they started last week to rebuild the temple. We talked about Karen's last week. No offense, Karen. Um, we talked about how they uh, complained and whined and old people cried when they should have been excited. Uh, all that to tell you to get to this point for chapter 4 is when we ended last week, what happened was... As they rebuild the temple, they get the musicians out there with the horns and with the trumpets and whatever. Who knows what kind of horn they have. Some sort of musical instrument. They're making sweet music to the heaven to let the Lord know, hey, we're building your house. They're singing. They're making a joyful noise to the Lord. And the old Karens are over here crying, weeping and wailing loudly. So everybody is looking at them and paying attention to their craziness. And all that to say, then when chapter 4 starts, we see that the people who are around them have heard them. So they hear them, uh, and then we enter into chapter 4. And chapter 4 is a weird chapter in the book of Ezra. Here's why. All of Ezra to this point has been chronological, right? It's been like, we're in exile, we came out of exile, then we built the altar, then we started to rebuild the temple. But then you hit chapter 4, uh, and verses 1 through 5 were still chronological, right? Like we get there, you're going to see that they start to face opposition from people around. But then we go to like, then under the reign of this king, this happened. And under the reign of this king, this happened. And under the reign of this king, this happened. And then it says that the last verse in the chapter was, and then this halted the, the building of the temple. So then when you get into history, you start looking at it, you're like, well, now wait a minute. Because then you pick up in chapter 5, and it goes like back to... And you're like, what is Ezra, what is going on? Here's what he's doing. He is showing that when we rebuilt the temple, we faced various moments of opposition over time. Over time, through various kings and various moments and various things that went on, we faced opposition and God was still faithful to rebuild the temple. So instead of like, taking breaks throughout the, when he starts to tell the rest of the story, he just chooses to say, here's all the opposition moments we had. Here's all the times that we had opposition, that we had to work through something, that God still remained faithful even though it felt like he wasn't going to be faithful. 
which is chapter 4. Uh, and so to tell you that, we have to tell you that. Now, the interesting thing about chapter 4 is, if you don't know, the Bible is written in Greek in the New Testament, Hebrew in the Old Testament. And then if you are a Bible dork, you know, sometimes they say, and a little bit of Aramaic. Chapter 4 is the little bit of Aramaic. So there's letters in here that are written by pagans to Artaxerxes I about how terrible the Jews are. Those letters are written in Aramaic, and they're recorded in Aramaic because when they would communicate inside of Persian government, Aramaic was the official language that it was communicated in. So it's super unique that that is here, and that is in the text and in the old, when we find like Dead Sea Scrolls of these books, it's in Aramaic, which puts it contextually then in for the history dorks in the room to say, hey, this thing is historically accurate in at least that it's written in the language that they would have used to convey the letter, okay? So that is what is going on then in all of this. That's what we're driving at. And so for us this morning, you may go, you said a lot of words, and I don't care about any of them, <laughs> right? You may go like, what does this have to do with me. Now, if you've been coming, you know we've told the story already, right, about the overarching theme of the Bible that there's God creates man, and then man sins. Sin pushes us into isolation. And then when we're in isolation, we can have a reconciliation. We can have a moment where God calls us in the darkness and we come out. That's called the Exodus. And then man is Exodus out of darkness and into light. And when you're brought back into light, you're restored back to the original place, right? And that's kind of the theme of the Bible from Old Testament to New Testament. You yourself are living that theme. You are somewhere in that progression. You're either in sin uh, and in isolation or you, God is calling you to come out of darkness and you're approaching your exodus or you're in some form of restoration. So then when we look at this, what God is telling us through the book of Ezra, what Ezra is telling the Jews is, how does that exactly work? Well, for it to work, there can be no compromise. And if there's no compromise, then that is going to create opposition in the world you look at. Because what we're really talking about this morning is definitions, how things are defined. Now, let's really break this down so we can understand why these people are frustrated. God creates the world and puts us in it and then gives us perfect definitions for how that world will work. Perfect definitions for love, perfect definitions for money, for perfect de definitions for sexuality, perfect definitions for humanity, perfect definitions for righteousness, what's right, what's wrong, perfect definitions for truth, for knowledge, for understanding. All of these definitions are perfect from God given to us. When we sin, we change the definition. You understand that? So when you sin, what you do is you go, I hear your definition, God. I see what you're saying. I understand what it is you're conveying. But I'm choosing to make my own definition. I don't care what, I don't care if you say to me that sexuality is sacred between a man and a woman and it's to be in the minds of marriage. I reject that definition. This is now my definition. And when you reject the definition, then God removes himself from you. Because you are not adhering to his definitions anymore. You're adhering to your own definition. He is not God over you. He is not Lord over you. You are now Lord over yourself. And then when you go into that isolation, because you are no longer in a relationship with the God who created you, then you have to give answers for your own definitions. Which creates all kinds of problems in the world. You people who showed up on Wednesday night and went through the worldview stuff and are like, please don't talk about worldviews right now, Pastor Pat. I can't. Please, you can make my brain. But there's truth to it. If you remove God from the system and you remove the basis for understanding for how the world works and you remove the basis for ethics and righteousness and choices and you put it all into the hands of man, then you end up in what? Chaos. It all just becomes opinion. Philosophy. What do you think? I don't know. What do I think? What, what about what she thinks? What about what they think? Right? You end up in this messed up, screwed up world where we all are fighting over whose definition is right. And it's in that darkness and that isolation and that lack of understanding that then God begins to call to you and say, uh, hey, stupid. My definitions have never left. Like, I know you've gone out and played some games. I know you've gone out and tried to figure this out yourself. 
I know you've gone out and made a real mess of things, messed your life up, messed things up. You've put yourself in a real dark place. And I know you're still lost, confused, and angry and hurt. But my definitions are still the same. How I see the world and how the world is designed and what I intended has never changed. I am the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if you come back to me, you can have the definitions back. So you don't have to figure out like who determines what's right and who determines what's wrong. Who determines how we should live and how we should act. Who, should, who determines how we should view money and how we should view community. How we should view relationships. How we should view our spouses. How we should view our children. Like all of, all of that. All of the chaos and the overwhelming things about that has already been laid out for you. And that's why God calls us out of darkness and says, hey, just come back to here. Like this, you're never going to find the answers out there because the answers are here. The truth is not out there. The truth is right here. I have the truth. The Bible goes as far as if you seek truth, you will what? Find it if you seek it in God. So just come back. And when you come back. And you come at your exodus moment, when you move back and you say, okay, I'm going to take up these definitions. God says, okay, okay, welcome back. Good to have you. We missed you. We kept your seat warm. Now, when you come back, you can't bring any of those crazy definitions with you. That's my only rule. You come back home. You can figure this out and you can come after me and you can follow me and I will bless you and restore you and put you back how I want you. But to do that, you can't bring any of your definitions. You have to leave your definitions over there because your definitions are lies. They're not true. You, you've declared things that you have no basis to declare. You have made semantic and word arguments about stuff that you don't have any basis for. And I am the way, the truth, and the life. I have understanding. I get creation because I'm the creator. So if you come back, that's fine. But to be completely restored, then you have to put to death those definitions. And that is the fight of every Christian then. Because inside of you, inside of your sinful nature, inside of that inner mind, you still have the idea that are my definitions wrong? You may be thinking that right now. You may be like, hey, I, I like what you're saying. But deep down inside of who I am, are we really to believe that we can't find any truth apart from God? Yes, that's true. Whether you like that or disagree with that, I don't care. Because if you disagree, you're just creating your own definition. What's your basis to say that's not true? I think it. Well, hootie do. <laughs> if I show up in here this morning and declare myself an Olympic figure skater, <laughs> that's the appropriate response. None of you are like, we want to see that big boy in spandex and leotard swimming around on some ice rink somewhere, right? Nobody wants to see that. This body is not built to be a figure skater. And me declaring it and making that my definition and then getting mad at you if you, well, I cannot believe you would not accept my definition. I am a figure skater. No, you're not. And you just saying it doesn't make it true. And we laugh at that, but then if I show up and you go, I'm a good person. Well, why? Well, because I'm good. Well, what's good? What do you mean what's good? Well, you've declared yourself to be something. You surely have a definition for what that thing is. Well, you know, good. No, I don't know. What is good? You know how I know that's true? Pickles. I love pickles. Hot pickles, dill pickles, garlic pickles, sweet pickles, big pickles, little pickles, pickle relish, pickle spears, Pickle slices, all of it. Pickles, love them. But do you know that there's people in this world that won't eat it if it even smells like a pickle? Like if you say, hey, do you want pickles? They'll be like, I'm out. I'd like a cheeseburger, no pickles. Yes, I am a communist. Thank you. <laughs> well, how can that be true? How can pickles be good to me but not good to you? I mean, if good's a universal that we can just declare about ourselves... Pastor Pat, that's a strong man argument. You're being trite. No, I'm not. There has to be a basis for what it is you're saying. Otherwise, it's just opinion. And opinion is not definition. Opinion is just opinion. It's just what you think. It's just your opinion on something. 
right? I like rap. I hate rap, right? It's opinion. I love pickles. I hate pickles. But when you start to talk about morality, when you start to talk about what makes a human being a human being, when you start to talk about sexuality, when you start to talk about how we should view money, how we should view poverty, how we should view widows, how we should view orphans, when you start to talk about that, you don't want opinion. You want somebody or something to lay out a definitive, this is what is correct. Which is why then we have to be willing to concede we don't know what we're talking about and we need God to give us definitions. Think how easier the world is if we just trust God's definitions. It's not like these definitions or these things that he lays out are mean or hateful or racist or bigoted or put against somebody or are designed to hurt people. Like these definitions are supposed to make the weak strong, the last first. They're supposed to bind us together. They're supposed to set us free from the isolation of sin if we adhere to these definitions. And yet people stand in firm opposition to them because they don't want to give up their own ideals. And you see that when you look at Ezra chapter 4. It starts like this. Now when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the returned exiles were building a temple to the Lord, the God of Israel, they approached Zerubbabel, the worst name ever. It's hard to be intimidating if your name is Zerubbabel. <laughs> and the heads of father's houses and said to them, well, let us build with you. We worship your God as you do. We've been sacrificing to him ever since the days of Asheridon, king of Assyria, who brought us here. But Zerubbabel, Yeshua, and the rest of the heads of the father's houses in Israel said to them, You have nothing to do with us in the building of the house to our God. We alone will build with the Lord, the God of Israel, as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, has commanded us. Then the people of the land discouraged the people of Judah and made them afraid to build and bribed counselors against them to frustrate their purpose all the day of Cyrus, king of Persia, even under the reign of Darius, the king of Persia. Feels a little weird, right? Doesn't feel like how the, you would think this would go. Kind of paints out Zerubbabel and Yeshua and their plan to kind of be elitist jerks. Well, what do you mean? You're building something and somebody shows up and wants to help and they're like, we're good. Well, why would they let them help? Well, you got another backstory here. So we don't know who this guy is when they say they came back with the Asherinon, the king of Assyria who brought us here. Nothing in biblical record. Don't know who that is. We do know that some of the Jews came out of Assyria and came back to the northern areas and settled at some point. We don't know who this is. What we do know, though, from 2 Kings is they, these people are uh, they're, they're syncretists, which means that they have taken other pagan belief, pagan gods, and they've just slapped Yahweh in there with it. So we're going to worship Asherion, we're going to worship Baal, we're going to worship these very Molech, all these various uh, Near East pagan psycho gods, and then we're also just going to worship Yahweh too. We're going to take the definitions of Yahweh and slap them with the definitions of these pagan gods and make it all one thing. Which is why then these faithful leaders... These people who recognize that when they've come out of isolation and they've come back to follow God, that when they've come back, they've submitted their own definitions. And the only definitions we're going to go upon are Yahweh's. And Yahweh says, have no other gods before me. There is only one God, me. So when these guys show up and they're like, hey, let us be a part. Include us in. Validate what we're doing justify our sinful nature by including us in your community and if you do that we'll help you rebuild your temple and they go get lost you want to be a part and you want to rebuild then forsake your pagan gods and come after this god but otherwise see you later we know they don't they know right from the beginning that they're not going to do that they call them what adversaries these guys are enemies they're not here to help they're here to water down Gospel. They're here to water down Yahweh. They're here to water down the Old Testament law. And the same is true in the world you are in today. This world doesn't try to directly contradict Christianity as much as it tries to take Christianity and water it down. 
Take the definitions that God has and just expand the borders a little. And then use arguments that say, well, you know, that was just written for that specific time. You know, that's not directly dealing with this sin today because this sin is different because we're wearing shoes. <laughs> right? It's that stupid. Like, well, you know, I know the Bible says this, but what it really means, in my opinion, is we don't care about your opinion. We don't. We care about the definitions that God sets for us. Well, now, with Pastor Pat, you can't just dis dismiss. You can't just dismiss what people are saying. You, the critiques, you've got to talk about the critiques. You can't just say the, the critiques that there aren't valid. I mean, the Bible is 2,000 years old. How, do, how can we trust? How can we know? How can we? Because the definitions that the church has had about how to live and how to act have been the same throughout history. That's the only religion in the world like that. That's not true. There's other religions that have not changed. No, there's not. Look it up. All of them have had moments where they've shifted in views, shifted in ideas, shifted in purpose, shifted in meaning, split. You have all of the Shiite Muslim and all of the Sunni, and they are radically different in belief and approach. Two totally different things inside of one split over doctrinal issue. Christianity is not that way. When there's doctrinal dispute inside of Christianity, when there's questions that come into place throughout history about definitions that people don't like, the church has collectively come together, declared that dispute a heresy, and removed the people who are saying things that are not within the confines of the definitions that God gives. When you go back, way, way back, like 300 AD, when you get back to the original, way back to the old school guys, they're still preaching Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by Him. They're preaching justification by faith. They're preaching salvation is found through God and through Jesus alone. They are preaching the same things that we are preaching today. That message has never changed because the definitions are not given by man. They're given by God. And God is eternal and has existed since the beginning of everything. He created time. He was and is and will always be. And His definitions have existed within His very character. And when he created it, he put those definitions into play and into the world. And that definition has not changed throughout time. And when oppressors and when people who are opposition have come up against it, the church has been savvy and smart enough to recognize the heresy and to set it apart. And say, this is not who we are or what it is that we believe. And so today in the world we live in, we still are facing people who are trying to say, well, what about this and what about that? And what I would challenge you with is know your church history and you have to go back to who it is we are called to be. Well, why? Because mankind, without the definitions given by God on how to live and how to behave, descends into tribal chaos. We descend into evil, warring beasts of the world. We need a good and loving God to establish how we should live and how we should act. Now the difference is, the way the world approaches opposition is different to how we should approach opposition. Because if you're listening this morning, you should recognize, Pat, you are still saying we have to be opposition, right? We are at war with these people, but you're not. The world's at war with you, and there's people in this world who don't like Christianity. They don't like the definitions God's established. They don't like the people who would submit to those things, and those people feel like they are at war with you. But Christians are not at war with them. Jesus says, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. When they beat him uh, and make him carry his own death device, when they nail him to a tree, when they pull his beard out of his face and shove vinegar into his mouth while he is bleeding to death, hanging on a cross, he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Well, why? Because he can recognize that the definitions that they are living by have led them into darkness, and that darkness leads to destruction. And he says, my definitions have not changed. And if they would repent and come back to my definitions, then they would be who they're supposed to be. So I'm not at war with them. I'm at war with the ideology and the thought processes that they have. And those ideologies and those thought processes come from the enemy of this world, from the, and the spiritual realm that's different than this world we're living in. They are victims of the enemy trying to convince them that the definitions 
definitions I gave them are right. So I'm not angry with them. I'm not in opposition to them. I'm in opposition to the ideology and philosophy that's led them into darkness. I am calling them back. <coughs> and then you're to be the hands and feet of that. So you're not supposed to get on Facebook and post about how you hate Democrats. <laughs> Or how anybody who has had an abortion is going to split hell wide open. Or how God hates the gays. You are attacking people. You are attacking people who are confused by false definitions, but they still are sacred and created in the image of God. They still have purpose and meaning and they just are lost. Who's the bad person in that story? If you have a child and you go to the mall, the mall is the place where you, we used to go shop for everybody who's young. <laughs> when I was little, my little brother, who's awful, <laughs> wandered off in the mall. And we had to find him. He was lost. You know what never happened? There was not an adult in the mall who saw my three-year-old little brother who walked up and chastised him for being lost. They didn't walk up and go, you're so stupid, you little idiot. Why would you wander off away from your parents? You deserve to die. Somebody's going to kidnap you and cut your head off. <laughs> we laugh because that's crazy. You wouldn't do that. If you find a lost child, unless you're an awful person or a criminal, what do you do? That's not right. This child's three and playing in the fountain. Where's its parents? <laughs> we need to find its parent. We need to take it back where? Home. So you go to that kid and you go with, with kid gloves on. Hey buddy, what are you doing? Playing in the fountain. <laughs> Then what do you say? Where's your mommy? Mm -hmm. Where's your daddy? Mm -hmm. Are you supposed to be out here by yourself? Mom. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you are not in opposition to a three-year-old. They're just lost. That's how God views you when you decide I'm going to take up my own definitions. That's three-year-old behavior. Today, Dad, I'm Superman. Okay, buddy. <laughs> Why are you Superman? I watched it on Netflix, and I believe I can fly. <coughs> All right, well, don't jump off of anything. <laughs> but you don't attack the person. Because they're just kids. Don't know any better. So when we attack and when we deal with opposition, it's different than the way the world do. What's the world going to do? We're going to try to hurt you. That's what the rest of chapter 4 is about. Uh, verse 6, and in the reign of Osarius, in the beginning of his reign, they wrote an accusation against the inhabitants of Judah and Jerusalem. This is Sirius. Uh, that's the Hebrew name for Xerxes 1. Seven, verses 7 through 23, I'm not going to read it all to you. If you're at the Bible door, you can go home and just lose your mind. But it's multiple letters written to Persian kings about how terrible the Jews are. And it's all lies. That's what the world's going to do. They've already told themselves lies about the definitions, about how everything works. It's not hard to make a definition out then about people who know the truth. These Jews are evil and terrible, and if you let them rebuild the city, they're going to go to war with you. They secretly hate you, and they're not going to pay their taxes, and they're going to they're have marches where they talk about how fat you are. It's that crazy. They send that to the next king, Artaxerxes, because, you know, the Persians not real creative in names. And so then he sends back and he's worried, like, well, we can't have an uprising. What do we do? You get all the way to verse 24. Then the work of the house of God that is in Jerusalem stopped, and it ceased until the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. So 20-some years... From the time Zerubbabel comes out of Babylon with the intentions of rebuilding the temple until they actually start to rebuild the temple because of opposition. Because these people won't let it go and keep making stuff up about him and keep standing in the way. Now, 
as the Jews in this, they could have what? Gone to war with those people. Right? That would make sense. Fine. You want to pick a fight with us? We're going to kill all you surrounding people. And we're going to do what God called us to do. But they don't. Why? Because they know God is still faithful. This may bother you, but it's a fact about Christianity that you need to tuck down deep inside of your heart. No matter what storm, what garbage, what persecution, what opposition, what oppression you walk through, the definitions that God imparts don't change. Well, so, uh, but I should be happy. And everything should work out. And, and the Bible says everything works out to the good of those who love the Lord. And I love the Lord. And this is not working out. Because he said he was going to rebuild the temple. And he's not rebuilding the temple. And we're just stuck here with these pagans. And they're saying mean things. And they're writing letters to the king telling them that we're not nice. Right. That doesn't change the definitions. Your garbage is not bigger than the definitions that God gives for creation. And in the Old Testament, there was less leniency and grace than in the New. So it's even worse for us. Jesus goes as far as say, let the wheat and the chaff all grow up together and I'll sort it out at the end. Let the weeds grow in the field and let the good stuff grow too. And since I'm God, I'll just pick the good stuff out when it's over. So do you mean there are always going to be people who are opposed to us? Yep. Yep. That's why Paul said, be in the world, but not of it. Well, how do you do that? You deny all their definitions. You reject every worldly definition for everything. And then you just take up the definitions from Jesus. Well, how am I going? That's a lot. <laughs> what if I mess it up? What if I think a definition I have... It's a biblical definition, but then I find out it's not a biblical definition. Oh, you mean spiritual maturity? You mean like the first time when you're a little kid that you jump off the back of the couch because you think you're Superman and you fall and bash your head in the floor and get a giant goose egg and have to put a big old bag of frozen peas on it and regret every decision you've ever made for your five years of life? <laughs> so the next time that you're back up on the couch, you're like, I ain't jumping off of here. That hurts. You mean the recognition of maturity, of growth, of being able to recognize this thing that I think I should be able to do, now I have discovered I'm not supposed to be able to do it, and since I believe all definitions for everything come from the mouth of the Father, then I'm going to lay aside this definition that I've made up because I know the truth now and the definitions are found in God who created me and not out here in creation in my own mind? Yes! And that period of growth, that's grace. That's when God loves you like a child and goes, hey, stupid, stop jumping off of the couch. Stop running to other people to validate who you are as a person and run to me. Your value and your worth is not found in your relationship. Your value and worth is found in me. Your value and worth is not found in how much you can accumulate. It's found in me. Your value and worth is not found in how powerful you are in your community. It's found in me. Your value and worth is not found in who you have control over and who you can manipulate. It's found in me. Your value and worth is not found in what you've given away to everyone around you. It's found in me. I define who you are. I set your definitions. I have set you free. This world has put you into bondage and you have listened to lies of the enemy and I am telling you the truth. Come unto me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I will set you free from this. So yeah, we approach those who are oppressing us differently. We approach those that we are in opposition differently because they are children wandering in darkness. They are going to lie. They are going to make stuff up. They're going to be petty. They're going to say things that are hurtful. They're going to talk about us. They're going to mock us and make fun of us. They're going to have giant marches and tell us how terrible we are. They're going to go on TV and say we're bigoted and hateful and we don't like anybody and we're closed-minded. And we don't care because it's children. Their opinion, their thoughts, their ideas are all lies. There's no truth. There's no definition in any of this. And so therefore, we don't 
care what they say. What we care about is the true definition of who we are. And that definition is only found in Jesus. And so this morning it comes down again to you're either one or the other. You are either a believer in the definition set by God on how to live, how to act, how to think, how to reason, how to have community, about your sexuality, about relationship, about everything, everything under the sun. You believe those definitions are found in Christ Jesus and in found in the God who created you. That's what you believe. Or you are an unbeliever. You are an unbeliever in the definitions that God has set on his creation. You have heard and seen, this is how this world works, and you go, I don't agree. I believe this. One way leads to eternal life. It leads to peace and joy. It leads to being able to be content in all situations. It leads to maturity and an understanding on how to live. It leads to righteousness. One way leads to death. And the God who loves you lets you choose. He lets you decide who are you going to be. He's not abusive. He's not going to force you. He's not going to shake you and say, you got to, you have to believe the way I say you have to believe. And if you don't, I'm going to slap you in the head. He says, no, if you want to wander into darkness and you wander, but I want you to know that every step you take out into that isolation, I'm going to scream your name. I'm going to stand right here. And I'm just going to keep screaming your name. I'm going to put a light up in the sky in case you get way out there. So you know where home is. No matter how far you get, no matter how far away, no matter how separated, how lost in darkness, you can always see the light shining and hear the voice calling. And some of you, that's going to drive you to restoration. And some of you, that's going to drive you to rage. I just wish dad had shut up. We get it. You're over there. You love me. You care about me. You have a plan. Just let me do what I want to do. But some of you, it calls you back. And you get out there in the darkness and you start testing these worldly definitions and you start to go like, these people don't know anything they're talking about. Like these definitions have changed over and over and over for the last thousand years. Like the defin none of the definitions, are, nothing is true. There's no truth out here. Yeah, there's only truth at the light. If you want truth... If you want those definitions, if you want to know who you're supposed to be, if you want to know freedom, if you want to know how do you break out of the mold the world to put you in, that's only found at the cross. That's only found at the light of Jesus. It's only found where you bring all of your selfish garbage back and you put your definitions to death and you take up his definitions. <laughs> Until you set it right, you're just lost in darkness. So we see then if we look at chapter Ezra, if we look in this chapter of Ezra, chapter 4, you're going to face opposition. You're going to have people who are going to be naysayers. You're going to have people talk bad about you. You're going to have people that are going to say a bunch of stuff that isn't true. God's definition doesn't change, and he still rebuilds his temple. He still makes you into what he wants you to be. He doesn't care what they think. Why do you? Let's be a church that is not consumed with being friendly to people who believe things that aren't true and be more consumed with exposing the glory and the power of a God who would open the gates of heaven and pour the knowledge of understanding of creation out on those who will believe. Let's be willing to admit we're just guessing in the dark on how to live. And we need a God who will impart his understanding, his definitions to us. And then let's recognize that while embracing those definitions, then we become the bearers of those definitions. And how we live and how we act with those who are in opposition to us is a reflection of the understanding of the definitions imparted to us. Christ died for sinners. He died for people who disagreed with him. He died for people who rejected him. How much more then should his church, his remnant, those who follow after him, love those who don't love them back? 
Must be that church. Let's pray. <laughs> Lord, I come to you this morning. And I just lift up everybody in this room. Lord, I pray that you would work in the hearts of people in this room. Lord, I pray that anybody who is here today who is in between believer and unbeliever. Somewhere in their own process of exodus, Lord, I pray that you would begin to expose to them just how lost in darkness the word world is with its definitions. Lord, I pray you would begin to reveal your definitions to each and every one of us. Redefine how we see ourselves. Lord, establish that first. Give us our identity that is found in you. Set us free from addiction, from pain, from hurt. Set us free from sin. Set us free from the things in our lives that we are clinging to that have no hope and no purpose. Lord, I pray that you would use us to be an example to those who are around us, Lord. Those who stand in opposition to us. That by your light shining in our life, they would see your definitions on full display and how we live and how we act. Help us to be mindful of sinners. Help us to hate sin, but love those who are sinners. Help us to love those who are lost. Let us think about them like we would think about lost children, Lord. Give us a righteous fervor to find those who are lost, to bring them back to the Father who created them, who's looking for them and wants them, Lord. Lord, I pray you would make vintage a home for people who are lost, for wayward sons and daughters. Lord, let this be a safe place where people can come and gestate, sit, and think, and ponder. Let this be a place where people can take weeks to figure out which definitions they're going to take up and who they're going to go after. Lord, give us patience to deal with people who are not moving as quickly as we think they should in their salvation track. Remind us, Lord, that we all were in sin. We all were in isolation. And we all have our Exodus story and our restoration awaiting for us if we will turn and come back to you. Lord, I pray you would raise up disciples in this church, apostles, teachers, preachers, prophets. Lord, you would empower your, your power and your spirit upon them. You would give them a boldness to share their faith and talk about what it means to be a follower of you. Lord, I pray you would rebuild your temple in this dark world. Help us to be a light. Help us to be a beacon in the darkness. Help us to be a place that everybody knows they're always calling our name. Lord, give us patience and give us hope to reach those who are lost. It's in your name we pray. Amen.